we start um so uh, today my my topic that i want to kind of discuss with you guys is like this latest strain of research that i'm kind of doing for the past like 2 3 years where i'm kind of like exploring the use of the blockchain uh you know as a decentralized uh, computational resource and i'm going to be talking more about that uh you know and you know our our kind of like research forays into this like what results we got um so this talk is like very interactive uh you know and and i like as i kind of interacted with people and when i kind of talk to them about blockchain there is a lot of intrigue and there is a lot of um you know kind of um, curiosity about you know what the blockchain does how it works uh, and things like that so it it feels as if like there is magic going on and people don't know like you know what's bitcoin what's blockchain what's the difference things like that right so i so this started in 2018 like towards the end of my phd i started you know because my phd was in decentralized computing and i had explored a lot of uh, you know kind of uh, problems in decentralized computing but i always felt that there is a need for like a decentralized computational platform on which you can or- uh, orchestrate the algorithms that we are writing so there are a lot of decentralized algorithms but it's not pure decentralization um, as such so this is basically motivated by that so i'm going to be kind of uh, discussing um, you know um, two case studies uh, you know these are like case studies that are like you know that eventually got published as papers uh, but before that i'm going to be giving like a brief tutorial on what the blockchain is how should you view the blockchain uh, and specifically how does the blockchain relate to my work uh, you know and my philosophy of using the blockchain as a decentralized computational resource so so that's that's the objective and that's the motive uh, you know behind my talk today right so uh, like murat mentioned i am a postdoc at uh, georgia tech industrial and systems engineering i got my phd from the from the same place and a lot of this research is kind of split across a work that i did at georgia tech and also the work that i did uh, when i spent a summer at nec research uh, in san jose california so you know so it's basically a combination of this uh, these two stints of mine and uh, it wouldn't have been possible without uh, you know the support of the sam non security program fellowship uh, that i was that i received in 2018 uh, in fact that is what like motivated me to think about like you know um, this concept of decentralization especially as it relates to power and things like that so i'm going to be talking more about that i am obviously like i owe a deep sense of gratitude to my advisor professor gabriel and my uh, you know colleague dan lee at uh, georgia tech uh, she is now moved to clemson so so with that uh, you know being said let's just kind of move move on so um so basically you know like a broad outline of my talk i mean i usually don't put an outline slide in my in my talks but i felt that for today's purpose i think it's good to have an outline so that you can follow along and kind of like track where you are going you know with respect to all the new information that's coming your way because as then it could become quite a bit of stuff to unpack so i'm going to be talking about like the traditional block a uh, traditional parallel computing uh, paradigms that we have as of now so what what tools and applications can you use today if you want to design a parallel computing application and then i'm going to be talking about what is a blockchain uh, the various concepts related to a blockchain what is a distributed ledger uh, consensus protocols what do they mean what what do you mean when you say that basically the motivation behind the talk about using that as a computational resource what is what are the qualities of the blockchain that make it perfect uh, you know tool to be used as a computational uh, as a completely peer to peer decentralized computational resource Uh, i'm going to be talking a little bit about smart contracts because they kind of go hand in hand with blockchain and uh, you know finally i'm going to be talking about the case studies like you know the two case studies the papers that i mentioned uh, the first one is actually related to federated learning uh, so there is a little bit of information uh, about federated learning uh, it's kind of becoming all the rage these days uh, and and i kind of like tried to kind of do blockchain with you know deep learning or federated learning so that's the first case study in the second case study is with respect to the replay attacks uh, you know detecting global replay attacks on power systems uh, you know in a, in a decentralized blockchain driven manner 
so there are like some theoretical results you know and some you know kind of empirical results for both these case studies that i'm going to be discussing then finally like you know a, a bunch of conclusions so if you kind of snooze during the whole talk these are the things that you really i mean i would really like you to carry home with you uh, and and that's something that i'm going to be covering in the conclusion so um, so so that's that's my outline so what i'm not going to be talking about is bitcoin right i am not going to be talking about how do you make money using bitcoin what is the price volatility all these things these are completely outside my research domain this is not something that i am interested in bitcoin cryptocurrencies basically so when i say bitcoin i'm just talking about cryptocurrencies in general is something that i don't deal with and it's a whole different you know research area that that is kind of completely different from what i do so uh, so if you are here to kind of get tips on what to do to kind of improve your like you know uh, kind of like wealth and all that so you know you are in the wrong talk so you probably should leave right now uh, you know so having said that and with that disclaimer out of the way let me just begin uh, so first thing i want to do is kind of give an overview of parallel computing as such uh, so you know so so my uh, research uh, you know during my phd has basically kind of looked at kind of you know this this kind of distinction between two two uh, paradigms within parallel computing so one is what is called as pure distributed computing so distributed computing is pretty much uh, you know kind of more common i would say than Uh, than other modes of com uh, of compute, you find that everywhere. Uh, you if you run a job on uh, AWS, if you have any cloud based, um, you know, um, application that you've ever interacted with, chances are that it is probably distributed in nature. So if you've written a Hadoop application, big data, Spark, you know, or if you've written any type of a GPU application. all of these are distributed in in nature so what do i mean by distributed distributed means that the work is parallelizable across multiple computing elements or processors right but there is a central coordinator which is coordinating these processors uh you know while the computation is taking place so this model of computing fits all these different frameworks that i have outlined over here so whether you are running something in hadoop spark hpc like mpi and uh, you know cuda or like you know on gpus or aws or azure wherever you are you are you know and if you're like using any of these application and most of these applications i mean if if you're talking about parallel computing you would probably using be using most of one of these applications so that's distributed computing right so on the okay what happened on the other hand uh, what what uh, you know what is also kind of like um, uh, another mode of computing another paradigm of computing that also exists is actually decentralized computing decentralized computing is not as common and one of the main reasons for uh, decentralized computing not being so common is the fact that arch architecting orchestrating applications without the presence of a central coordinator is actually very hard and very few attempts in history have been able to pull it off and uh, you know there is like one pop quiz that i have like you know if anybody can kind of name one decentralized uh, you know computing experiment that actually succeeded and 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 kind of like you know has changed all our lives you know you can drop it in the in the chat uh, you know but and i will i will reveal the the you know the answer to that at the end of my talk uh but you know during the talk like you know if you are kind of paying attention i'd like to re i'd like you to really think uh, you know about like a decentralized computing um paradigm that has actually kind of changed our lives it's there it's 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 we like we use it every day but anyway the point is in decentralized computing there is no coordinator there is no aggregator it's more peer to peer in nature you are sharing and kind of uh, acquiring information uh, you know in real time and the idea is to kind of solve a global problem with just peer to peer communication and 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 peer to peer information exchange right so a lot of these experiment a lot of the, these uh, kind of um, logos that you see on the screen right 
most of them i mean i don't know if if like i i think most of you might be might be from you know 90s kid it, you know back in the 90s we used to download music through napster and like limewire and all those types of things they were actually decentralized in nature it was working on you know a global scale and you know you could download files and things like that and lately in the past 10 years like blockchain of course has become like a big decentralized uh, you know computing project Uh, multiple projects like you know there are like you know uh, hyperledger like you know ethereum bitcoin all these types of things so the fundamental difference is that there are multiple process processing elements you know compute nodes that are connected by a spectral graph and there is peer to peer pure pure peer to peer communication that's going on without any aggregator what you notice here is that most of these you know decentralized computing uh, platforms seem to be blockchain based and 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 that is the you know kind of revolution that's going on where people are now starting to realize that decentralization actually has a lot of lot of benefits and advantages okay so now that brings us to this question of what is the blockchain right what is this big deal about blockchain what is it uh, so what is the blockchain it's nothing but a chain of blocks that's it like right there there is nothing uh, you know there's there's no rocket science about this it's just a chain of blocks the whole concept is the fact that it the control of these blocks is decentralized in nature that is what you need to keep in mind um what is in those blocks so every block contains some data pertaining to the global state uh, during which the bl uh, block was uh, formed right so i am kind of creating blocks and at each point that i create these blocks i am putting i am encoding some data pertaining to some global state what is the data what is the global state is something that we will come to later but just kind of keep this in your mind how is the data stored right uh, the data is stored in a uh, in a data structure called as the distributed ledger so is are all blockchains uh, having distributed ledger uh yes most of them do but there are other data structures uh you know that is uh, that are also there some of them are directed acyclic graphs that also is used as a data structure to store that data and does that count as a blockchain uh yes so you know that is the you know blockchain kind of completely comprises of this this whole uh you know area how is this ledger modified it is it is modified through agreement among the miners uh, and the next next question is who are miners miners are the compute nodes uh, that validate these changes to the to, to these states right and how do they do that they do that using what is called as a consensus protocol so these miners are con constantly communicating with each other there is a protocol that governs how they com uh, how they communicate when they communicate how often they communicate and through this consensus protocol they're constantly modifying and the state of the blockchain is evolving more and block more and more blocks are getting added and they govern how these blocks are kind of going into the chain okay so now the the specifics about the blockchain if you think about it in 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 the course of human history blockchain i mean it, it, the whole concept of the of the ledger is something that has been uh, kind of like very intrinsic Uh, we have always had some uh, amount of record keeping mechanisms that we have developed over the years you know and and you can you can think of it like a spreadsheet so like you know of the amount of money you owe to someone and amount of money some other people owe to you it's basically that right so a data structure that contains records of the global state and it has to be public and immutable that means the 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 record is public and how to change it is something that is very specific clear cut and uh, cannot be done arbitrarily so it's hard to manipulate right so miners are actually the the compute nodes in in a in, you know in 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 a network and and each each miner uh, actually has a copy of the ledger so think of like all the miners uh, you know have their own individual copies and the changes to that is happening through the through the consensus protocol and um, you know like i said in the beginning basically this communication is happening you know in real time uh, and the 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 state is getting modified 
So let's uh, walk through an example. Uh, so let's say there is like a minor network of uh, six, mi uh, seven miners, right? And uh, let us say that at this point of time, uh, there are like, you know, the, the, the blockchain has reached a st certain state, right? So now we are at state D and there is a set of chains like state A, B, C, and D. Uh, and, and maybe there are more states, you know, beyond A. Uh, so what happens now? So let's say one user comes and he says, I want to change the state to E, right? This particular individual can be a minor, uh, you know, or can be an outside user. So the proposal is floated. Uh, he, he or she might connect to one of these miners and, and a proposal is floated about like, okay, I want to change this to state E. Now, miners will now do a broadcast that do we change it to state E? Do we change it to state E? I mean, this, this is the question that, you know, that gets propagated throughout the network. And what happens then? They will validate. Is this uh, really true? Uh, you know, can we actually change this to E? Now, these questions that I am referring to, like, you know, can we change this? Is this possible? This is what is the crux of the consensus protocol. Like what governs when the state changes is something that you encode in the consensus protocol. And that is what makes all the difference. Uh, like I will talk about later on, you know, when you might have heard that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency mining takes a lot of compute resource, it's very resource hungry and things like that. It's usually to answer this question as to should we mo modify the, the state? Is that change valid, right? So, based on some logic, they will kind of go through the proposal and they will say, okay, validated, like, you know, and then slowly everybody has started validating. One of them probably failed the validation. Yeah, you know, they, you know, minor two said that, okay, this, this is, this doesn't make any sense. And minor seven has also said that it does not make sense. Uh, doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, uh, the, the validation is, is invalid uh, or uh, the state change is invalid. So in this case, you can see that a majority of them have validated the change of state. So as long as the majority has kind of voted in its favor, the state change process will go through. And uh, there is consensus among, among the miners because there's a majority uh, who have agreed to change the state to E. And as a result of that, state E gets appended to the chain, right? So, and this process continues. So like I, said, uh, uh, like I said earlier, the whole crux of this, uh, you know, this, this decision process comes down to the consensus protocol. Now the consensus protocol actually has a lot of like, so when you're designing a blockchain application, you actually have multiple, uh, you know, uh, consensus protocols that you can choose, right? And like I said, the whole question on whether the state needs to change or not is dependent on the, the compute that you are doing to actually check that, uh, check the answer to that question. So if you are having, uh, you know, proof of, there are like multiple, I mean, these are just some of the uh, examples of uh, consensus protocols. There are multiple, uh, you know, uh, consensus protocols if, if you look at like literature. Uh, so proof of work is what is used in Bitcoin and quite a lot of other cryptocurrencies. I think Ethereum has now moved to proof of stake. So in proof of work, what happens is that there is a computationally very uh, intensive, uh, you know, cryptographic puzzle that each miner has to solve, right? And whoever gets the answer, so it's it's easy to uh, verify the answer, but it is tough to come up with the answer. Uh, so they get a reward, uh, and and this is how it uh, it progresses. In uh, proof of stake, uh, every miner will stake some amount of uh, cryptocurrency or or, or money. Uh, as a measure of honesty. And when the miner starts getting, if the miner is kind of peddling malicious blocks, then, you know, you kind of deduct that money uh, or deduct like a penalty from that uh, stake that has already been pledged, right? And proof of authority is actually, you know, more applicable to private blockchains, like, you know, proof of stake and proof of work are public blockchains where anybody can join and you know it's kind of being run at across a global scale and uh, you know and and computation is happening by miners anybody can be a miner so it's public 
uh, and 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 you know like identity may not be verified and things like that but if you decide to set up a private blockchain where you are able to guarantee the, uh, the identities of all the parties that are coming together to set up that private blockchain then that means that you can have like uh, you know a proof of uh, you can you can uh, kind of get rid of all the compute intensive uh, tasks that you would def you would have with proof of work uh, you know using what is called as proof of authority by kind of you know you're basically kind of uh, shifting the onus of uh, trust uh, onto the fact that the 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 uh, parties to the blockchain actually have some a uh, heft in the real world so that's that's what uh, this does and it gets rid of all that compute intensive tasks and it is usually very easy to kind of uh, maintain so uh, as a computational resource so when i talked about you know this this thing in the beginning so blockchain becomes a com computational resource uh, you know uh, because you can extend the use of the blockchain beyond simple money transfer that it was originally intended as because ultimately remember that blockchain actually keeps track of the the state uh, you know of of like it, it keeps track of a global state and you know you are employing a, a consensus protocol uh, 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 you know in, in real time to keep to keep that consistency so the question then becomes can we leverage the blockchain to build a decentralized compute resource and this is a fundamental question that i'm basically trying to answer so how would this computational resource look like there are multiple parties that can contribute to a shared global state there is no one single party that is controlling the whole um, you know compute process all the changes are happening via the consensus protocol and it can be like you know it can kind of pave the way for ensuring that there is trust fairness transparency and a lot of other computational benefits uh, you know by just kind of leveraging the blockchain as as purely a computational resource right and uh, smart contracts are like a utility that have been proposed in uh, you know uh, in the blockchain community and they are actually very widely used so they come as a layer on top of uh you know the the existing blockchain framework and basically the idea is to kind of open up the blockchain to developers so that they can write an application and these applications are usually called dapps so you know so this is now becoming all the rage where like people are writing uh dapps and like you know with with decentralized finance and things like that uh but ultimately what the smart contract is doing is that it's it's actually a program and i'll i'll kind of also cover that uh it's actually a program that that runs uh, on top of uh, the you know uh, the blockchain you know and, and it's kind of like you can write code and it gets executed on the chain right so how does a smart contract look like so let's consider a very simple uh you know uh, instance so you basically have a um, uh, you know um, you know a, a bunch of variables this is actually a smart contract you can actually write this and deploy it to the uh, to the blockchain so let's say that you're you're writing a function to set a parameter a b and you you have a function to just add two numbers right so let's say in the beginning state a has like you know all these three variables set to zero uh, uh, what happens is that um user a user comes along and says that i want to set a to 1 right so as as part of this process uh you know the state has to change to you know to a new state because now uh, you know a uh, a's value has changed so you know the state changed to to one and underlying consensus protocol was the one that made it happen right and then now user you know b comes along and says i want to set b to 2 and and now you you are invoking you know uh, this function set underscore b in the smart contract and that changes b to 2 right and somebody else comes along and says that i want to add what is a and what is b and you know that also is getting encoded into a state which goes through that mining process uh, everybody has to all the miners have to be satisfied or rather the majority of the miners have to be satisfied before it kind of gets encoded into into the chain right so as you can see you know computation on the chain can become quite expensive so the more computation you are able to offload to off chain uh, you know uh, status the more efficient your blockchain uh, uh, algorithms would be or any blockchain based application would be uh, so that is uh, the the first thing so 
as a result of that, uh, I, I, I have kind of like gathered a bunch of uh, facts and statistics. These are actually a little dated. Uh, so this number might have come down, but computation time will increase, you know, because the underlying consensus has to take place even for a small change. And the more compute you, lay, you kind of put down into the smart contract, the more bulky and heavy the smart contract becomes. That means that more and more time is CPU time is spent by the miners to try and accomplish the, the, the tasks that, that you have encoded in the smart contract. So the computation cost you know, is, is, in, is really, really significant. In the Ethereum world, we measure the, uh, the compute cost in terms of what is called as a gas value. And it's approximately like around $65,000 to like per GB. And remember this was like, I think in uh, 2020 when Ethereum was trading at $220. Now Ethereum is at $4,200. So this would have gone up by quite a bit of, you know, kind of, uh, I think would have gone up like quite a lot. But anyway, the, you know, the, the it's, it, so why do you have to pay this money? You have to pay this money because the miners are volunteering some amount of their resource to help you accomplish the tasks that you want to accomplish, right? So that's the reason this goes to them as fees. So it's a very primitive computing environment in the sense that you don't have the luxuries of writing code like how you do with Python or Java. Floating point variables are not supported in, in, in Ethereum uh, right now. Uh, you know, you have to convert it to integer. You will lose precision. Things like that are, uh, will happen. But these are like some of the pitfalls, you know, before you kind of consider writing a DAP, uh, you know, these are the things that you need to keep in mind. So the point being that, you know, these DAPs that you're planning to write need to actually be very computationally quite efficient, right? And our experiments that we did during, you know, these, these two, I mean, during our, uh, my research uh, were done on an Ethereum private network, uh, you know, that we had to set up, uh, you know, in-house, um, you know, and, I, and I'll go to, I'm going to be talking about that as well. So before we move on, I'd like to just pause uh, and ask if people are following along and if there are any, any questions or, uh, sorry, I stopped sharing. Uh, but anyway, like I, I'd like to kind of, just kind of see if there are like any questions that people might, might have uh, until now. Um, I can start <laughs> asking the questions. So first of all, very interesting talk. I, I'm, I'm trying to follow everything. Um, the, my, my first question is that, so my understanding is that blockchain is, is built as a peer-to-peer -peer system, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, let's put it this way. So how many, how many computers or miners should be within a system that you can call it a successful blockchain? Um, that's kind of like a, a, kind of like a very interesting question. So if you just have one miner, then it's not distributed or decentralized. It's just centralized, right? So the whole concept of blockchain becomes a, a thing with more uh, number of miners that you have. So can you call, um, uh, uh, you know, a system with two miners, a blockchain shop? You can set up a blockchain with two miners. So that is really not, uh, you know, kind of, it basically depends on your application. Like for instance, if you have like, you know, 1 million users, uh, you know, trying to verify, uh, you know, something and you just have two miners that are in charge of doing that, then there is a lot of centralization, right? Uh, you know, so that's the reason, you know, you they say that you should not put your money down on, cryptocurrencies that have not yet proven their metal, right? Like which with very few miners, which, which are just starting out. So let's say me and you launch a cryptocurrency today, right? It will have like, uh, you know, and we do it. We don't use the existing platform, but we decide to write our own uh, ground up, right? Mining uh, application. So for it to kind of get traction with the community and make sure that it doesn't get attacked, it will take quite a lot of people to kind of join in to make sure that there is a uh, thing. But having said that, established uh, blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum, can they face attacks? Can they be uh, you know, thwarted? For sure, right? It's just a question that uh, of whether it's practically feasible to thwart them or not, because you need to take over 51% of those um, you know, um, of those uh, miners, you need to kind of uh, take over 51% of those miners in order to kind of completely subvert that blockchain 
uh, and and make it uh, you know kind of work in your favor um, i have one more question so you talk yeah. about proof of work versus proof of authority yeah. so i can understand when you are doing proof of work it would be open to to have more and more minor miners to come and you know provide you with their computation power yeah. Yeah. but when you are doing proof of authority you are just basically investing everything so yes. what what is the what what are the pros of proof of authority that you know it's a lot of investment for a pri to put together private blockchain right so uh, what are the major you know advantages uh, that is pushing you toward it okay so um in both cases you have to invest uh you have to invest uh, resources if you're talking about in fact i would argue that proof of work Uh, people coming in and putting in their resources is far more expensive than trying to just launch your own proof of author authority based chain Be why because proof of work demands uh, you know cryptographic answers right like they want i mean the whole proof of work consensus is running on the basis of whether the miners are able to deliver an answer to a cryptographic puzzle or not it's basically just a hashing uh, algorithm so you hash uh, and you want to find an answer so finding an answer is actually quite tough uh, so for that the miners have to it, it becomes at a, I, I, you know and and the difficulty of this mining is actually increasing with time so every 4 years the bitcoin reward are rewards are halving right like so in 2020 it halved uh, and uh, if you want to become a miner on the public chain then it is much more difficult than uh, you know let's say for uh, proof of authority purely on the basis of the consensus protocol but these two things are seldom used it's kind of like apples and oranges basically because proof of authority is for a private chain which means that if you are a consortium of companies uh, let's say you are like a set of power companies and you want to aggregate and and find some uh, you know and solve some problem and maybe keep record of a certain uh, you know kind of prices or whatever it is then and only then will you use proof of authority as it doesn't make sense for you to go into proof of work at that time because everybody's identity can be verified right so it's a, it's a private type of a setting nobody can arbitrarily join your network from outside right so it's kind of like a vpn uh, you know within uh, kind of like a kind of a closed uh, community so that is what um, proof of so it's basically the the use cases are completely different so that's why when i st started kind of uh, discussing the blockchain right so that time uh, i mentioned that the consensus protocol is where most of the action lies right so when you are designing an application you need to first think whether it's for everyone and anyone can use it or whether you want it to be for certain set of people that you trust and you want to establish a sense of trust within that community then you would use proof of authority thank you okay so i'll uh, now i think uh, i'll just go into the case studies that we uh, had um so i think i'll 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 still have a bit more time for questions uh, at the end um so one thing we decided to do was to see if this blockchain uh, based mm -hmm. paradigm can be used to address uh, you know certain uh problems in uh, in federated learning so for those of you who don't know uh, federated learning it's this machine learning paradigm that distributes the process of you know building machine learning models across a network of user devices the idea is to kind of preserve data uh, you know of the users and you know you basically rely on on a centralized aggregator to kind of collect all the locally trained models aggregate them come, come up with a global model uh, that is kind of pushed back to the users and this whole process keeps repeating over and over again so that's classical federated learning you need an aggregator for that but because of the fact that the aggregator's role is centralized you have all these kind of different problems you know with respect to can you trust the aggregator you know is it uh, even possible for you to set up an aggregator uh, you know and and things like that right so the idea was to kind of uh, explore if blockchain based uh, aggregators can actually deliver the same amount of uh, you know qu model quality and uh, accuracy as your classical federated learning 
So the smart contracts actually are used to power this uh, aggregator, um, you know, um, uh, you know, to kind of discharge the role of an aggregator in a completely decentralized blockchain based um, uh, setup. Right. So that's the question. So can we leverage the blockchain to uh, orchestrate an aggregator free environment? So it turns out that that you can and, and that is that the motivation is to investigate the, the use of the blockchain. So you want to preserve the, the benefits of classical federated learning. You don't want to move any data. You don't want to kind of, uh, you know, invest in a lot of infrastructure. Uh, but but you also want to be able to kind of do this uh, learning uh, in and of itself. So if you have, uh, you know, uh, if you're trying to kind of do this on the blockchain and uh, you're trying to or uh, um, orchestrate an aggregator free mechanism, then you need to also uh, bear in mind that it doesn't, it's not easy. So there are like a bunch of challenges. So there, like I said, high compute cost on the blockchain is a thing, right? Uh, picking the agents to kind of aggregate the models and when you're having a decentralized setup, how do you even choose? What is the question of choice, right? Who is choosing, right? So these are the types of things. How do you assimilate the models from the agents that have been selected? So these were some of the challenges that that we kind of uh, addressed in this in this work. So when you uh, when you're talking about aggregator free, um, you know, uh, federated learning, uh, you are actually trying to kind of uh, do federated learning with this. I mean, so in our in our uh, project, we were looking at deep neural nets, and and these deep neural nets can be quite expensive and kind of tedious to kind of uh, aggregate over the chain because the, the block sizes are very limited in nature. Uh, it, it cannot be changed, it's very difficult to change that. And you and, and we all know that like, you know, simple deep neural nets are actually quite uh, quite bulky in nature. So the idea is to kind of break down the, the you know, the, the deep neural nets into smaller mm -hmm. chunks and kind of uh, keep pushing those chunks, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the chain. So to kind of give you an idea of how that works. So let's say that you have four assets, you do like some local training and you're able to score the, the chunk, you know, uh, based on their worth. And, you know, the smart contract is now accruing your, your just your scores, uh, mm -hmm. chunk scores. And that happens for all these, uh, you know, these assets. Uh, and uh, based on that, you know, you have like a cutoff mm -hmm. of participation level and based on whoever has participated in that level, uh, you know, they will, then be graded on the worth of their chunks and those respective chunks will be chosen. So this is what we kind of proposed. And we applied this to the concept of maximizing ride sharing revenue because usually, you know, people who drive, uh, you know, for ride sharing services, uh, they usually do not have a way of kind of finding out where should they go to maximize their revenue? Like if they just finished a ride, you know, where do you go, uh, you know, next? Uh, should you hover around on the same location or should you move to a new location? This is something that, you know, that the idea was that these ride sharing, uh, you know, community can come together and solve the problem in a decentralized fashion, perhaps uh, without, you know, kind of accruing all the cost of setting up a central aggregator in the cloud uh, and kind of making this uh, type of thing happen. So we um, used deep reinforcement learning and, uh, you know, the idea is to kind of uh, leverage federated learning to kind of, uh, you know, make sure that every driver learns from the experience of the other drivers, you know, historically. So, you know, you have like a reinforcement, simple reinforcement learning formulation and you have like, you know, um, mm -hmm. kind of like a batch neural fitted queue update. Uh, and and the local DNN is constantly uh, learning. It's, it's, a, it's a simple two hidden layers and, uh, you know, 500 neurons on each. So we did six simulations on New York City taxi data set. Uh, you know, we, it had like 1 million uh, rides. Uh, so uh, got some interesting results, right? So uh, without any learning, it turns out that uh, the, the we, we are able to kind of deliver a 40% increase, uh, you know, in the driver revenue on an average uh, simulated aggregated basis. Uh, you know, for our frame, with respect to our framework, 15% increase, uh, you know, based on purely local learning. So if the driver is not coordinating at all with anyone else, they, they will kind of, and if they use uh, our technique, there's 15% jump. And the most important thing here is that our framework was able to kind of deliver the same quality as classical federated learning. So that is the most important thing because we'll never be able to do better than that. 
the the best that we can hope to do is kind of meet that quality and 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 we kind of did in in this paper so um some other kind of quick results uh, you know how does the learning process change with respect to you know the size of the chunk uh, you know so you can see that kind of it basically the more the chunk size uh you know the the more saturation um, it occurs in fact it starts degrading uh and you know with respect to you know the time that it takes you know the more the chunk size the time actually decreases because now you know that contention between chunks actually um is less because you have a higher chunk size but lower number of chunks right so that happens and uh you know with respect to the participation level you know it turns out that if you have a more participation level that can actually be detrimental because that means more contention uh, you know in the in the smart at the smart contract level right so there quite a lot of interesting results and you know i'll not be i i apologize i am not able to kind of cover the whole details of this paper and i invite you to kind of take a look at uh, this thing if you are interested in 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 more details the next work that i'm going to be talking about very briefly is you know the decentralized detection of global replay attacks and and this is a this is a paper that we just got accepted in uh, transactions and systems managed cybernetics so like we know that like you know um, basically the us power grid has a complex and a very diverse organizational structure there is no central command and there is a varying degree of you know federal uh, oversight uh um, there are like different types of markets multiple stakeholders and to just give you an example just a small uh, you know thing that you see on the map over here on the left it can you can actually you know kind of if you take if you zoom in there are like multiple stakeholders that are there as part of just that small uh, iso uh, you know pjm right so uh, basically the question is that you know can you detect an attack that is happening at a global level within this iso wherein the utility stakeholders are not forced to share their data to a central location right so that's when we kind of started looking into the different types of attacks that can happen on a power system so you can have a false data injection attack replay attack and a covert attack a uh, false data injection and covert attack are not the kind are beyond the scope of our study so we are going to be focusing on the replay attack which basically means that a malicious uh, attacker is manipulating control actions to the plant uh, you know and that's kind of giving you the impression as to you know from the plant operator's perspective he is not able to see any changes but you know the the equipment is slowly degrading and it might actually lead to some catastrophic failure at at some point so that is the idea behind the behind a replay attack and uh, you know to detect the attack you basically have the kalman filter model where you are kind of acquiring the data push, uh, putting it through a kalman filter and you know based on the residuals you are basically raising an alarm right so now the question is if you are having these types of multiple uh, you know if these types of systems wherein there are multiple stakeholders how do you even detect uh, on a global scale first you need to check if it's an attack indeed then you know you need to answer the question are others also facing this attack because you as a utility stakeholder remember that big map if you are one of the stakeholders you don't have any way of uh, you know kind of communicating with the others so are you also are others also facing this attack is a, becomes a big question and how do you coordinate this attack on a global scale right how how do you make sure that all of them come to this uh, are are on the same page with respect to the global cyber security health of the entire network as a whole so this is one of the important task so the challenges is the fact that you have you know local analytics uh, you know you need a coordinator to aggregate those insights from those analytics and uh, and then you know you want to do it in such a way that you do not incur any type of costs you don't have to kind of uh put you know data on a central server and and you know uh, you're not you're not kind of going through uh you know the pitfalls of a centralized paradigm right so uh when it comes to like these data driven uh you know cyber attacks uh, in in power grids so what ends up happening is that there are already programs that kind of try to uh, address these things but there are a lot of reasons why these problems uh, why these programs are usually uh kind of you know um participation is low because they actually incur quite a lot of uh, companies have to incur quite a lot of financial expenses uh you know they have to kind of make hardware upgrades to their it infrastructure and also the other question is like you know 
why should i share data becomes a big thing uh, and in the us there is no uh, there is not much uh, regulation concerning you know um, and and no legal obligations for utilities to actually participate in these programs which is why participation actually is quite low right um, so so th that is one of the things that that kind of really kind of baffled me but you know but it is what it is so uh, so now if you consider the blockchain as a as a resource so you can raise an alarm by doing purely local analytics at the utility or a stakeholder level uh, you know with respect to you know the question of whether others are also facing the same um, situation you can push local attack probability to the chain and then you can kind of do a bayesian inference uh, mechanism uh, to actually detect whether the the attack is is actually global or you know whether you are the only one who's facing this type of a situation so what does what are the benefits you basically get to keep complete privacy and ownership of your local infrastructure data only the attack characteristics and the insights are shared but the raw sensor data that you are acquiring from the uh, from the assets are not are not uh, are not being shared and you basically remove the need for a regulator completely so utility stakeholders are able to kind of come together come to a consensus and decide on oh there is an attack there is no attack looks like the, you know the the probability is going up maybe the, somebody is attacking us maybe we need to take some corrective action right and you are able to do that at a fraction of the cost that it would have been if you had gone and kind of you know involved a centralized aggregator so very quickly like we basically involve we basically took the help of the ethereum uh, solidity uh, to write the smart contracts on the on the uh, ethereum virtual machine on the on the blockchain and uh, the idea was to uh, like i said in the beginning compute efficiency is a, is a is very important so all the heavy duty operations like a global multiply and a, and a global uh, addition most of them have been kind of offloaded on to you know the local um, you know analytics itself and you just have a very small you know like uh, compute footprint uh, one global sum and like two global multiplications so the decentralized algorithm is assuming that you know the attack is considered global if more than one regions or utilities are you know uh, under attack uh, and the regional attacks themselves are uh, independent so you have the alarm that is reported by the uh, algorithm the likelihood of the alarm being true on one region and you know you have the uh, true positive false positive of these alarms and using this theorem that we kind of highlight in this paper we are actually able to guarantee a very very lean computationally efficient smart contract that just does the global attack detection uh, so global attack probability that just computes this global attack probability and using this theorem we were able to kind of really save on compute costs as it kind of occurs on the on the chain so if you look at the real time uh, you know uh, the the quality of the results so let's say that the attack starts at a simulation epoch of 100 you know you have like varying attack magnitudes uh, and the simulation time and you will see that like you know it's able to detect you know based on the magnitude you know the 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 probability the global attack probability uh, is actually kind of gra gradually starts increasing uh, you know after the simulation epoch uh, for the attack uh, and and that is actually a function i mean how severe of uh, you know attack is it is determined by the magnitude which basically also shows up in the trends concerning the global attack probability so this was all done on the on the chain and one of the uh, uh, you know the basic things that people kind of ask is oh but isn't it computationally very inefficient or like you know doesn't it kind of involve quite a lot of cost it doesn't it turns out that you know the more number of regions you are adding and this is partly because of the the theorem that i kind of shared in the beginning you, you, we are able to kind of really make it Uh, you know we were able to crystallize the computation of the global uh, attack probability down to just one global sum and one global multiply so that's the reason we are able to kind of deliver uh, quite a scalable uh, approach for for this because if you num increase the number of regions you know the the time taken to compute does not really go up now the question is how do you compare this what do you use to compare this blockchain based technique so we chose the broadcast gossip algorithm which is also a decentralized completely peer to peer algorithm um, that has been proposed in literature the idea is that you have the similar peer, uh, you know uh, connected graph 
and and it's basically like a you know consensus among you know the different uh, you know uh, nodes that are part of this graph and uh, you can use this to kind of uh, set up a benchmark against which you can kind of compare your blockchain based algorithm right so basically the the question is can the blockchain beat the broadcast gossip so when you implement this on a real private ethereum network of 40 nodes uh, you know with with proof of authority you you basically get the result that i kind of show in the in the figure above uh, what you see is basically a, a you know a box plot at each of these time epochs you know a snapshot of how the utility uh, or the how the regions uh, that represent the utility stakeholders what is their understanding of the global attack probability so the straight blue line that you see is the is the global attack probability as computed by the blockchain and the box plots that you see with the outliers at every one of these epochs on the x axis is actually a kind of like a spectrum of where each utility uh, thinks uh, you know the global attack probability should be if you do the broadcast gossip right so you can see that like you know uh, such a crisp clear uh you know indication of the attack as given by the blockchain and if you just simply go and use the state of the art uh, broadcast gossip method then it leads to this wide variation uh you know in terms of what the probability actually is and in fact you know even for the for them to actually come to you know like su such that the median approaches the result of the blockchain itself takes like up to like 20 or 30 time epochs there's like that delta right so does that mean like with all this and i'm just going to wrap up in you know in like maybe 2 minutes uh does that mean that the computation is free on the blockchain you know because it feels like we've gotten off with gotten away scot free right we've just kind of uh, you know we've gotten like a great result and you know it's not even uh, kind of uh, showing any variation and and things like that no it just it doesn't mean that the computation is free on the blockchain it's just that the computation on the blockchain is more structured and less error prone because you have the advantage of the smart contract and you have a very clear cut uh, tailored uh, you know uh, consensus protocol and we went ahead and tried to classify this right like how does this change so you know in our paper we we basically try to characterize this um, you know this um, this aspect wherein we we show that you know that compared to the blockchain a broadcast gossip framework demands a lower initial error so if you want to rival the result of the blockchain you need to have a broadcast gossip framework that needs to have a very low initial error which basically means that it has already reached somewhere close to the final state to begin with right and then it's actually very uh, you know it's it's not that uh you know robust to the change in the overall network mean which basically also means that it's the process of computing the probability has probably reached the steady state uh, wherein there is not much change uh, and only then will you be will the broadcast gossip be able to rival the performance of the blockchain so this was one of the other uh, insights from from our work and in conclusion you know what i would like to say is that i hope that during this whole presentation i have at least managed to kind of uh, impress upon you the fact that blockchain is and can be thought of as a very viable decentralized computational resource uh, orchestrating any application on the blockchain requires a lot of thought and it needs a lot of uh, you know kind of you need to put a lot of special care into this the computation and community uh, communication cost uh, on the blockchain needs to be a top priority when you are designing a decentralized application and decentralization obviously has numerous benefits whether it is improving trust fairness accountability you know ensuring data privacy and the other latest thing that i'm i'm looking at now is how the how decentralization can actually save on infrastructure and maintenance costs uh, that you typically encounter with centralized paradigms and it can be a really nice way to bring multiple different parties together to actually you know conduct uh, you know um, computation that can serve everybody's needs so with that i end my talk and you know and basically to answer the question that i had posed in the beginning of the talk as to what is that one decentralized 
computing tool that all of us are using today and the answer to that is actually the internet so uh, i have not seen the chat maybe somebody some of you guessed it but maybe some of you didn't but that's fine but i think the internet is the first uh, decentralized experiment that actually went through uh, and it is something that has been super successful uh, you know and we are using that and it's constantly evolving multiple stakeholders and somehow it all works so with that i end my talk and i'm obviously open to questions uh, i know we are just we just have one minute but i'm i'm happy to take any questions